Hey guys, welcome to the Learn Feng Shui podcast, where you'll learn feng shui from a classical point of view, taking out the myth and superstition. So if you're interested in learning feng shui, Chinese astrology, all things Chinese metaphysics, as well as the superstitions and myths that connect it all, you'll enjoy learning feng shui with me. Welcome to today's episode. Today we're going to talk about the feng shui of a haunted house. What could indicate that a house is haunted? All right, guys, I hope you enjoy this week's episode. It is a re-airing of the 2021 feng shui of a haunted house. I usually kind of put it up annually and revamp it a little bit. So I hope you enjoy today's episode of Feng Shui of a Haunted House. I'm going to take a few days off to enjoy my birthday, which is the 30th. So, um, yeah, but uh, so today, this week's going to be a replay, so I don't have to do recording. Um, Next month, I have a couple fun topics coming up. I can't wait to announce. But until then, you guys enjoy today's episode and have a spooky Halloween. So what are some things you need to look for? You know, what could you you know, possibly look at your house and see that could indicate a haunting. And, um, again, I I'll note that these sources, um, that I've learned from in the show notes, so you can go check out their work. I don't like taking credit for, um, any work that I, you know, didn't come up with myself. And so if I learned this from another practitioner, I will link either their, like their website or the video I found in, um, down below. So the first thing you want to look at is, um, certain types of trees. So certain types of trees, um, the weeping willow specifically, it's supposed to said to be like overly yin. So anything that's in your environment that is overly yin, inactive, particularly dark, is said to be able to cause that haunting effect. Some say the banana tree can cause this effect. Although I've also heard it said that a banana tree can actually be used to uh, win the lottery. So I'm kind of torn about the banana tree. I'm not so sure. Um, but anything that creates an overly good environment, um, speaking of trees, I had learned from Master Joe Ching, he kind of talked about the fact that if you have a lot of overgrown shrubbery that is putting a lot of shade over your house, you know, you're not getting sun into the windows, then that can cause an overly yin environment and you could, you know, possibly see hauntings in that that space. So keep your shrubbery trimmed away from your windows and make sure your house gets a lot of natural lighting because again, that overly yin environment in a space can denote that the space may be too yin and may, you know, harbor some sort of um, spirit that you don't really want there. Most notable Um, certain objects in your house can cause a spirit to, you know, come into your house or it can be attached to an object. I used to love to watch the show with the ghost hunter or ghost detective type person named John Zaffis. It was called Haunted Collector. And he would go into a house and he would kind of narrow down in somebody's house what, um, you know, was, was causing the activity in their home. And he would either like get it, he would collect it, he would put it in a museum, he would, you know, dispose of it in some kind of way. Um, but it definitely is true. I've heard more than one time that people have brought something into their house that they have maybe collected or they, you know, they got it at a garage sale. Maybe they got it at Goodwill, an antique store, or maybe they inherited some stuff from, you know, a family member that passed. And after that came into their home, they had issues. Uh, Most notably, last year, I did a podcast with um, these two ladies from the Wives' Tale podcast. I think they have since have retired that podcast. But in speaking to them, one of the hosts told me that she got a painting that caused activity to be, uh, you know, present in her home. And she found out that it was actually a Celtic warrior goddess who had been um, like, uh, tortured and killed. And so that was a representation that she was bringing into her home, but definitely something was attached to it. She, um, kind of honored the painting, put it in a spot that, uh, was honoring to it. And she put some like crystals and stones. And I think she put some salt around it or something. 
But yeah, so bringing objects into your home, you have to be careful about where you're getting them from and seeing, you know, have you noticed increased activity once you have brought that object into your home. Um, another story that I think is crazy is that um, I am taking classes with a, a feng shui master of Jensen Go. I'm taking classes with him. Um, and he's from Singapore. Well, one of his other students is from um, China and he was saying that he did a feng shui consult for um, a family that had ghostly activity and he noticed that the bowl they were using to store their rice in or like the container they were using to store their rice was actually an urn that's right they were storing their rice in an urn and um he actually told them he couldn't do their feng shui he there was no way he could fix that and um yeah he didn't do that and so i kind of feel the same way i've never never worked on a house that's haunted and i don't know if i really want to um but yeah be careful about what you're bringing into your house and where you're getting it from another thing that a practitioner would probably have to look for would be um, the presence of certain combinations of what are called flying stars. Um, you know, they move in different ways. They affect areas in different ways. And um, another thing you can kind of note is, have you put up like a fish tank recently? Have you done some sort of renovation in an area? Have you moved a lot of things around? Did major decluttering, moved furniture? Um, that could actually activate an area that might be associated with a more negative flying star combination, um, particularly the flying stars associated with the number two and five. Um, if you know anything about flying stars, you know that the two five combination is always uh, pretty negative. It's, it's not a good combination to have, but sometimes when, you know, different things come in, like maybe a yearly star comes in and it affects it, then you may see activity in an area when you've never had activity before. So, um, this one I actually learned and I'll put a link to her, um, website and stuff down below. I learned from, um, master Jen Stone. So last year she conducted a um, she works with the International Feng Shui Association and she conducted a, a haunted house and feng shui um, class. And so I, I watched that and attended that. And she talked about the fact that her um, one of her clients called her and said her son was actually like experiencing some, some, some activity in his room. Um, and when she went, she realized there was a combination of flying stars there. She realized they put a fish tank there. She just simply had to remove the fish tank and move it somewhere else. And they were okay. So if, yeah, if you've done anything like that, um, I know sometimes people will say that they noticed activity after they start like renovating a home. And this could possibly be why um, sometimes if you have an established pattern of energy, you might not notice that, um, you know, an area is active. But then when you start activating it, using the area, maybe you renovate it, it can activate the area and cause some of that activity to be seen. Another thing you want to look for is living too close to a cemetery. I mean, I think this is just kind of just common sense. <laughs> so yeah, living too close to a cemetery um, can definitely, you know, have some activity. I kind of think, in my opinion, I feel like it's the way the cemetery is presented. I feel like if it's an old cemetery that has like broken headstones, it's not kept up well, um, you know, it's kind of in disrepair, you know, as, as those graves start to age and relatives and descendants kind of, um, also die off, you don't really have the care uh, with those headstones and, and, you know, and graves that you may have, um, in different cemeteries. So what I, what I believe is that, you know, the cemetery that is in disrepair is probably more negative than one that is in good repair. Um, I actually used to live with my home right in um, in front of a cemetery. The cemetery was directly in back of me. It was just separated with a chain link fence. I literally parked um, outside. I looked out my front door because it was like a, a, a duplex. And so my, my unit was to the back. And so I literally looked out and I would, you know, have a, there was a cemetery behind me and I never felt like I had any issues with this place. It didn't scare me, but the cemetery was one that was very new. It was mowed and up kept really well. And the flowers were also, um, you know, kept up very well. So it was an, in a nice, uh, you know, area. And so I never felt like I felt anything negative in that space. 
So for this next one, I'm going to reference um, my friend uh, Amanda Finch. So she goes by Amazing Amanda. She's super, super sweet, really nice feng shui practitioner that I've made friends with over the past, you know, few years, whatever. Actually, when I went to Colorado, I went to go visit her and uh, we chatted and had some, you know, feng shui talk. It was really nice. She has a YouTube channel and she's been putting some videos up, but today I noticed the topic was ghosts and I was like, yes, girl, I'm all about that. And so um, I just wanted to kind of read to you what she had on there and I'll put a link to her video below because the video is super interesting. You should go check that out. So um, again, let's see here. She addressed the fact the yin structures, which I didn't know about. Um, I knew about churches, but I never thought them to be associated with hauntings. Um, she talked about funeral homes and areas that were filled with really f like fervorous or like overzealous like worship, like constant worship. And so maybe like a temple that has monks that are constantly worshiping or praying or, you know, reciting, um, that would be a place that is very, very active. And so um, it's, and it's like prayers to heaven. She was kind of describing. And so when you have something like that in really close proximity to your home, that could, you know, denote that you might see ha some haunting activity within your home and especially areas that have a lot of sadness to them, like funeral homes. So you might want to note if there's funeral homes close by to where you live, um, I did not know this. She talked about the fire stations. So Again, fire stations have a lot of uh, noise, clamoring, activity. You know, the fire trucks come roaring out of there and the bells chime. And so she talked about the fact that you want to be at least six football fields away from a fire station because a lot of times what happens is the fire station will degrade the area around it. And so you may notice there's a fire station there, but there is not like that. Maybe the businesses around it won't be successful or they'll kind of be like decrepit, broken down. Um, so I would definitely check for that. Um, another thing I did not know about was the uh, tree stump. So if you have a tree stump in your yard, particularly if it's around four feet tall, it's said to be like a, a spirit. So you don't want to keep tree stumps in your yard. Um, you want to kind of grind those down and maybe try to remove those. Um, and she talked about the fact, and she reminded me of this because I forgot about it. Um, but the Northeast, if you have a door that is in the Northeast of your home, this is called like a ghost gate or, you know, it's like a, like a gate for the um, ghost to come in. And so if you have a door at Northeast, that could denote that you may have spiritual activity in your home. And another thing she kind of addressed is the hollow stems and hollow chimes. So sometimes by putting wind chimes, you know, that's a, that's a very popular thing for a feng shui practitioner to maybe talk about is putting wind chimes out. Um, if you put it in the wrong spot, you know, kind of earlier, I talked about that different, um, the different combinations of flying stars. So maybe if you put it out in a spot that has the flying stars for the year that you don't want to activate those two, five combination flying stars, then, um, you know, maybe you could see that ghostly activity. And she kind of talked about, she, and this is really interesting to me. So again, go watch the video because she explained it better than I can. But the fact that banana trees have a hollow stem in them, and since banana trees are associated with um, haunting sometimes, she kind of thought that it was more to do with the hollowness of the stem and the hollowness of the wind chime that denoted that ghostly activity. So for today's folklore tale, I'm going to be focusing on different uh, types of Asian, Southeast Asian, and Chinese vampires. Um, I will give a little bit of a trigger warning. Some of the stories do include um, harm to young children. So it's pretty common that if a person dies a violent death or if they have an improper burial, that um, they will come back as a, some sort of spirit. And here we have the um what is called the hopping vampire or the jiang shi i hope i pronounced it correctly it's a chinese myth that says if a corp a corpse uh, might reanimate for a few different reasons which include that violent death that improper burial and being struck by the lightning it says here also being hopped over by an animal especially cats so regardless of how it got that way the jiang shi means stiff corpse it can only move by hopping and it maintains its undead self by sucking the chi or life force out of humans. 
The Filipinos also have a similar vampire. It says here, uh, one called a body separating vampire. I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce that name. It's very lengthy. It is spelled (laughs) M-A-N-A-N-A-N-G-G-A-L. Translates to the body separating vampire. It says here, Filipino myth has some gnarly creatures of the night. A kind of oswang or vampire shapeshifter. This creature only feasts on pregnant women and their unborn babies. It separates its torso from its lower body in order to fly around, dangling its intestines and all. There is another type of vampire that's called a baby vampire. If you've ever heard a baby crying in the middle of the dark woods, that baby may need help. Or it might be a vampire. This type of Oswang is said to have spirits of children whose mothers died in childbirth or who passed before being baptized. So you might be wondering by now, what is an Oswang? An Oswang is, it says here it's a Filipino term. I thought I heard it described in African terms, but I may be incorrect on that. But here it says an Oswang is a generic term for malevolent supernatural entity in Filipino folktales. And I'll link um, all the links below. Um, It can refer to zombies, witches, werewolves, or even vampires. A vampiric Oswang itself is described as often taking the form of a beautiful woman for the purpose of infiltrating villages. Once it's trapped its victim, the creature uses a proboscis-like tongue to drain the blood of its victim. Alternatively, it's known as a mandurugu in the Tagalog language. Vampiric Oswangs are also considered as among the most dangerous supernatural monster in Filipino folklore because of their ability to live near or exist by um, other human um, like villages and, and, and stuff. So lastly, these malicious killers are said to often marry men for the sake of feasting on their blood. The husbands would slowly be drained at night till death arrives. The Oswang then moves away to remarry and the evil cycle begins again. In Malaysia, there is a vampiric-like creature here. It says, unlike Asian vampires on the list, the Bajang isn't of human form. Instead, it is a Malaysian folklore monster that is a weasel-like creature, small and inoffensive at first sight. But it's said to be created from the bodies of stillborn babies or the afterlife form of evil humans. The Bajang typical victims are children and infants. According to legend, the creature would arrive at a household looking harmless and even cute. And once it's accepted into the family, it will feed on the young. After the children are no longer, the adults are seldom spared also. Outside of the deception, the cry of the Bajang is said to... Be capable of inducing illness in children. The hellish shrieks additionally have the ability to spread madness and disease in the entire village. In short, like the case of the European vampire, this nasty monster is a creature you must never invite into your house because it spares no one. Everyone will be assured an awful death. And for Myanmar, we have a tale of the Kepfen. So the Kepfen is a demonic vampire that's actually created from black magic. It's described as a flying head with exposed entrails, which we kind of heard from that other um, description. Or sometimes it's a canine head demon. So the Kepfen is believed to be a nocturnal, nocturnal form of a powerful dark sorcerer. In its ghastly manifestation, the Kepfen hungrily sucks out the souls of its victims. Some myths even claim that the Kepfen are able to transfer ingested souls into the other corpses, thus creating zombie servants. Interestingly, the flying head description of the Kepfen, of course, resembles that of the uh, Malaysian um vampire also so in both cases the fiends are a result of demonic packs or evil sorcery likewise both monsters are said to be extremely difficult to kill at night no thanks to their ability to fly therefore they are best dealt with in the daytime during the hours with sunlight the sorcerers are said to still be deadly but have their actual mortal body so if i see a flying head coming at me i don't care what time of day it is i'm gonna get it <laughs> so here from Indonesian culture is a mythological creature called the uh, Liak. So the Liak is fond of sucking on the unborn children and babies' blood. 
Um, it's also said to be a deadlier version of the previous one I mentioned from, um, I think it was Filipino culture, equipped with a long tongue and fangs. It's capable of spreading disease. Lyaks are believed to be black magic practitioners with a taste for human flesh and blood. And worse, they inhabit graveyards, eat corpses, and have shape-shifting abilities. Most terrifying of all, during daylight, the Lyak is said to be no different from any other human. Once night arrives, though, its head and entrails break free from its body. This horrid Asian vampire then soars across the night sky, gleefully hunting for its prey. I really wonder what the theme is where they have those floating heads um, with, you know, the uh, <laughs> the spines or the entrails attached. Really weird, right? free energy mapping of your floor plan, please check the link in the show notes. To support today's podcast, go to learnfengshui.com, sign up for emails, leave a review, and share with your family and friends.